Did you see the style? Welcome to the Young IPA Podcast. I'm James. This is Pete. Good day, everyone. It is the 28th of April, and as promised on Friday's show, this is a huge show. We have got host of the Ruben Report, Dave Ruben, on the show. His new book, Don't Burn This Book, Thinking for Yourself in an Age of Unreason. We're going to be talking about some of the stuff that we learned reading his book, some of the wider issues around it. It is a great interview, if I do so myself, Peter. Yeah, awesome interview. And the best thing about it was that he remembered us from when we had beers in Melbourne last year. So look out for that bit. Yes, uh, we're definitely big time. So I also teased on Friday's show that we were giving, uh, we we're having a giveaway uh, as a result of this interview. So the details of that, so don't burn this book, Thinking for Yourself in an Age of Unreason. Uh, if you're listening to this and you're not a member of the IPA, head on over to ipa.org.au slash join. And if you're one of the 20 people, uh, the first 20 people to sign up with the promo code Ruben, you uh, win a signed copy of Don't Burn This Book with your membership. So promo code Ruben, I ipa.org.au slash join. First 20 people get one. So go. And then come back and listen to the rest of the show. Sound good, Pete? Sounds good. Let's do it. All right. I just want to make sure I got all the details right. So uh, without any further ado, we've got a whole bunch of show on the other side of this interview. We're going to be talking about the latest stats with the government tracing app. And uh, we're going to be talking about why aren't teachers in school. We've got heroes and villains. And Pete's not fine. I'm always, you know, the, the return of one of the great podcast segments in Australia right now. Pete's not fine. Yeah. Uh, but without any further ado, we'll head on over to the Dave Rubin. Okay, we now welcome on to the show, the host of the Rubin Report and now author of a book out today. Today, as people are listening to this, it's out titled, Don't Burn This Book, Thinking for Yourself in an Age of Unreason. Dave Rubin, welcome to the show. And I want to start there. Why shouldn't I burn this book? <laughs> well, actually, if you burn it, it'll be the best possible PR for me. So I'm not completely opposed to you burning it. And I am looking forward. I mean, some social justice warrior, some far lefty progressive somewhere is going to burn this thing. And uh, of course, the idea behind it is that the ideas that I'm presenting in this book are, are very, I think, common sense, basic ideas about freedom, about individual rights, some of the stuff that we've talked about before when I visited Australia and chatted with you guys. I mean, things that we all intuitively know are the right way to be free and to feel accomplished as a human being and find purpose and to uh, further a functioning society. Uh, yet, however, in the strange times that we live in these days, often these ideas of, of freedom and liberty are, are thought of as dangerous. And you know what happens when people find dangerous ideas. They either call you a Nazi or they burn the book. Dave, you dedicated this book to Ben Affleck. What is, has Ben given you any feedback on it so far? Has he enjoyed it? You know, I have not heard from Ben directly yet, uh, but as I'm sure you guys are aware, that was a little bit of a nod to when Sam Harris was on Real Time with Bill Maher and he was supposed to be doing a protected interview, meaning a one-on-one -on -one interview about his book. It's called Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion, which I have right over there actually. And they started talking about religion and Affleck jumped in and they started talking about Islam. And Sam was basically trying to make the point that you have to be able to criticize ideas, but what you don't want to do is be bigoted towards people, meaning you can criticize any idea, whether it's a religious idea or a political idea, or you can criticize the rules of a, of a sport. I mean, whatever you want to criticize as a human, it's your divine right to do that, but you don't want to be bigoted or prejudiced towards people. And in this case, they were talking about you should be able to criticize the ideas of Islam without being racist, in, in Ben's words, although it, uh, Islam is a religion, not a race, without being bigoted towards Muslim people. And of course, we all know that. The same way you could criticize the doctrine of Christianity or you could criticize the Old Testament, nobody would think that, that in and of itself uh, makes you anti-Christian or anti-Jewish. But in effect, Affleck called Bill Maher and Sam Harris gross and racist. And then the media sort of went crazy and suddenly... Bill Maher, who was the standard bearer of the left in America for 20 years, you know, beating the drum of leftism on TV for decades, basically, and Sam Harris, this mild-mannered neuroscientist, everybody's suddenly calling them racist. And for me, that very moment, I was watching it live on TV uh, here on the West Coast, as I did almost every week, that was my wake-up moment because I had been thinking all of these things about the left, the way that they keep labeling everybody and taking good people who maybe say something that you don't quite agree with, and then you automatically try to destroy them. 
And it was such a clear cut example of it. And also because it was happening to Bill Maher, who was a big influence of mine, and the fact that it was this A-list movie star doing it, um, it just, it became a real cultural moment. And it woke up, it woke up me, it, it took me from going from woke to awake, let's say, and it did it for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of other people. Uh, so I hope Ben will read the book. I, I should send him a copy, I guess. Yeah, we talked about it last time you are on the show, and it still is one of the great YouTube videos of all time. And if you haven't seen it yet, I cannot recommend anything more than going out and watching that. Uh, I just want to pick up on Bill Maher, you say there. Like, Bill Maher is fascinating to me. He is the hero of all of my lefty mates. Uh, I reckon he's coming around, and if he's not already, like, he's not coming around, he's already come around. When do you think Bill Maher next votes Republican? Because I think it's coming. Well, let's put it this way. I am finally going to be on real time on May 28th. So that's about a month from now. And that's the exact question, although I won't be questioning him. That's the question I want to ask him, because I think you're right. Bill is an old school liberal. Bill is what we would refer to as a classical liberal. He wants everybody to be treated the same. If you want to smoke pot, smoke pot. If you want to marry someone of the same sex, you can do that. And I think, unfortunately, what's happened with a lot of liberals, a lot of good liberals, is that progressivism and collectivism kind of snuck in. Identity politics kind of snuck in. And good liberals are always going, oh, I just want to be nice and I don't want to offend anybody and all these things. And before you know it, you can't say that men have penises and women have vaginas. You know what I mean? Like they, they sneak in all of this stuff that you're suddenly like, wait a minute, I have to judge people on the color of their skin? That's what I thought I wasn't supposed to do. And I think, unfortunately, Bill has sort of gotten himself caught in this a little bit because I think most of his uh, political ethos, I think, really is libertarian, live and let live with a little room for government. Now, I think he probably wants a little more government maybe than I want when it comes to uh, some government handouts and things like that. But I would love to discuss that. And by the way, that's what liberals are supposed to do. We're supposed to duke it out, real liberals, right? Not leftists. Uh, but I do think you're right that he is always good on free speech. He is always a defender of the right principles. And I think he's just gotten lost a little bit in that thing. And I, and I look forward to talking to him about it, by the way. And some of it could be sort of generational, right? It's, it's, when I talk to my parents, who I would say are good old-fashioned liberals, they have a hard time understanding what the left has become. So I think it's partly generational. And I think it's partly, by the way, you know, the guy's been doing this for so many years at such a high level that at some point, maybe you don't see the, the ground for exactly what it is anymore. But I don't know, and I don't want to impugn his motives. I look forward to talking to him about it. But I think, I think you're basically right. And, and your friends that are lefties, but maybe not totally in like the sort of crazy lefty camp, um, I think Bill, and I think I've done a little bit of it myself, I think these are the people that can kind of lead them out of that. Dave, I think you're exactly right on that generational thing. My parents are sort of old-fashioned lefties and they would have absolutely no idea what it's like on university campuses and what it's like on Twitter. So I think that's a really important part of it. Now, yeah. one of the things I loved about this book is, is that it's a roadmap. So it's not, oh, look, the left are terrible. It's almost like a self-development, um, what's it called? Self-help book where you can read it and learn how to come out about being uh, not a woke, hysterical lefty. Uh, was that an important element for you? It was because, you know, I talk about it right at the beginning of the book, but when I got the deal, I was actually on tour with Jordan Peterson, which was right around when I met you guys originally about two years ago, a year and a half ago or so. And the original book that I was supposed to write, I mean, on the deal that I signed, it was called Why I Left the Left. And that's the phrase that I did that PragerU video. And, you know, it's been seen like 20 million times or something. And so many people associate that with me. And I started writing that for about two, three weeks. And I kind of was just like, I don't know, this isn't really what I want to write. I don't want to write what I'm against. I want to write what I'm for. And I think that's what I tried to do here. So not only do I lay out my classical liberal principles and why I believe these things and why you should stand up to the mob and why you should come out politically because being closeted is not just some, about somebody's sexuality. You can be closeted about an idea you hold. Um, but I wanted to show people sort of a cohesive set of views that they could move forward with in, in the world. And, and actually, you know, right now with everything going on with coronavirus, uh, you know, certainly in the United States, I think these ideas, but I think it's worldwide, these ideas really are taking root in a new way because suddenly, you know, when you talk about borders, but it doesn't mean you're racist, I give a strong defense of why nationalism matters. Uh, I give a strong defense of the Second Amendment. Right now, you know, we're letting criminals out of jails and we're actually stopping people from buying guns in certain parts of the United States. Uh, there are principles about how you can live your life best 
that I think are feeling particularly uh, poignant because of what's going on right now. One thing, and of course, free speech beyond anything else. Yeah, so that whole thing about like people who are closeted with their political opinions, what a, a very constant source of feedback we get on this podcast is from young people who are at school or at university and they're too scared to say what's on their mind because like there's a group think and they don't want to be hounded by 11 people. And you know, Pete and I, and then they come to our podcast and they hear Pete and I talk and they go, oh, cool, there's someone out there that thinks like I do. Uh, and we just go, there's people in your classroom who think like you do. They they just similarly don't want to get in front of it. So what would you say to young people who are listening to this right now? And when they do go back to university, when they do go back to school, they're going to be still too scared to say what they really think. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot there. I would say first, it's like, think about your life for just a second. Let's say you're a sophomore, you're a junior in college, and you're not saying what you think is that the type of person you want to be 20 years from now? So you're 19 and you know, when you're 19, you, you've got youth on your side. You're, you're as physically fit probably as you're ever going to be. You, you have, you have like just unabandoned uh, passion for the future. Even if you're not loving life at every second, you've got your whole life ahead of you. And if at 19 they can get you, and that's why, by the way, that this thing is so dangerous in colleges, and universities specifically, if they can get you to shut up when you're 18, 19, 20, they've basically got you for the rest of your life. And I think a lot of college kids, students think that, oh, I can just kind of be quiet now. I won't, you know, I want to get the grade. I don't want to upset the professor. I don't want my friends to think I'm a weirdo. But then when I get out of college, I'll start telling people what I think, you know, and it's like, no, you won't. Because, you know, when you get out of college, now you got to pay rent or you got a mortgage and you got a car payment. And maybe you're trying to get married or you have other responsibilities. You have a job, all of those things, and you won't get braver. So I would say it is worth taking the risk. And, you know, as someone that's interviewed a lot of people that have gone through this, you know, all of the people that I know that have survived the mob. So Jordan Peterson survived the mob. Brett Weinstein survived the mob. Lindsay Shepard, James Damore. The, the, I've survived it. I mean, the list of people is endless. And all they did was stand up to it. I think the key is just, just being brave enough for a moment to say, this is who I am. And, and it's a better way to live, to be who you are, than to, to shy away from something so that maybe you're accepted. I mean, that's no fun way to live. What, imagine life is a movie. If, if life was a movie, what is the star? What does the hero in the movie do? The, the hero in the movie doesn't say, oh, can't somebody else do it? Or the hero in the movie doesn't say, I'm not going to say what I think. I'm not going to do what I'm supposed to do. The hero in the movie, you know, blows up the, light, the, the Death Star. The hero in the movie takes the ring to Mordor. The hero in the movie, you know, fights the machines if he's Neo. That's what you do. Dave, you describe in the book how coming out and living your truth is actually really good for you personally. You described how you as a gay guy came out and then the next day in Manhattan was September 11, by the way. So it sounds like a hell of a week for you. Um, but but you um, you came out and you, and you say that, you know, living your truth and being, and you got very Jordan Peterson at this part of the book. I liked it where you said, you know, if, if you live your truth, you'll be a much happier, confident person. And once you take that initial hit, your, your life will be so much better. Yeah, well, you know, it's hard to live one life, right? Like you guys are living one life. Most people are living one life. But it's hard to live two lives simultaneously. And some, some people, by the way, through a series of lies and manipulations and untruths, live three, four, five, six lives. If you are walking around on any given day not being fully who you are, it's the equivalent. Imagine if you were a painter. Imagine if Picasso was like, ah, I'm just not going to use the color blue. Would he have ever been the great painter that he became? You have a full arsenal as a human being. That arsenal is all of your thoughts. It's the summation of the things that you've learned and the things that you've processed so that you can experience the world in some sort of functional way. And if you choose not to do that, and, and by the way, often people choose it for what at the time seem like good ideas. You don't want to upset your family, uh, you, you, whatever your work situation might be. I mean, there, there's all sorts of reasons. You're not just in the closet, as I said, because of your sexuality or because of your politics. There could be some family secret that you're in the closet. about. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The point is, you have to conquer, you know, this would be to give you the Jordan Peterson version of this. I mean, this is, you got to slay your dragon. And when you slay that dragon, we're all walking around with something. And, and when you slay that thing, um, only good things will happen after it. It, it, is, not, it is not good to be uh, the bitch of your own crap 
sort of. How is that? Was that wordy <laughs> enough? Don't be the That's bitch the of your. Maybe they, yeah, maybe that'll be my next book. Don't be the bitch it's of your own. It's a great bumper crap. sticker. But, you like that, yeah. Like that's that really is the idea. And by the way, you know, one of the things that I learned when I spent that, you know, eight or nine days in Australia, which I loved every freaking second of it, and I met great people like you guys and had drinks with tons of fans and you know, it was just great being out on the streets and everything, is Australia has what I would say is the closest to an American ethos of just like it's your life, be live it how you want, you know, whatever you want to do, it's fine, go ahead and do it. That really is the essence of what we have that they don't have that as much actually in the UK. They certainly don't have it as much in in Canada and many of the other and, and certainly not in the in the Nordic countries that we visited. So I think for Australians, for you guys to be hit with the politically correct thing, it's particularly sort of nefarious because it's so against just sort of you know, what I think outsiders mostly think about Australians. We think about Crocodile Dundee. Here's a guy, he's, this is the guy living his life the way he wants to. And, you know, that's great. When they do those international polls, they always find that Australians and Americans are the two most skeptical of any authority. And it always gives me the greatest sense of national pride whenever those poll results come out. I'm just like, yeah. Well, you listen, you guys, you guys were a prison colony and we, were, we fled the, the king. So we <laughs> yeah, have our exactly. reasons, you know? Yeah, yeah, we know what we're uh, up against. So uh, I want to talk about, uh, you talk, when you started to say what you really thought and get away from the mob thing, you started losing your young Turks. So you were at the Young Turks, the internet, uh, em well, you know, crumbling empire now, but they, they were very big back in the day. Yeah. Uh, the Young yeah. Turk colleagues they, uh, and the brutal physical effects that losing your former colleagues and you losing your former friends had on you. And you point out that when you start talking about what you really think, except the fact that you're going to lose friends, like this is both completely correct and unbelievably sad the i the, i mean i'm a huge jonathan Haidt fan and he's done a whole lot of work on the increasing polarization of american society and australian society whereas like back in the 90s someone's political views didn't really affect how much of a friendship you were going to have with that person but today it is a huge factor so where is this polarization coming from well, I think partly we should recognize, you know, we like to do something where it's like, oh, things are equal. Oh, there's bad guys on this side, bad guys on this side. But, but what you're talking about, this sort of purging of friends or demanding purity of political thought, that very much is a modern progressive lefty concept. I can tell you very clearly and honestly that I go to all my speaking gigs, actually, are, I'm invited by conservatives and libertarians. Now, I have differences of opinion. With, with many, the more religious conservatives, let's say, on same-sex marriage. I have differences of, of opinion with conservatives on abortion, a series of other things, uh, legalizing marijuana. I mean, a whole bunch of stuff. But I am completely welcomed by them. And that's not a coincidence because there is a reason that people on the right, they haven't always done it that great, but they're doing it pretty well now, can agree to disagree. And the reason is people on the right basically believe in individual rights. They believe that if you are a member of society, if you're a legal member of a society, then there should be no special laws for everybody. In the case of the United States, we have our governing document, the Constitution, we have our Bill of Rights, and everybody should be treated the same, equality of opportunity, and then it's, it's luck and it's hard work and all that stuff, and then you're out on your own. On the left, and I, I really think this is the truth, on the left, there's no unifying principle anymore. The principle basically is we like government, and then the next principle is, well, I like government more, I like government more, I like government more. So it's like, you know, when Bernie Sanders, let's say, comes out and says he's for $15 minimum wage. Now, I, as a small business owner, I'm not for that. I think I should be able to pay whatever market value is, and, and if someone wants the job, great, and if they don't want it, great. Now, that's fine, but the problem for the lefties is that when Bernie says 15, well, then Rashida Tlaib or someone else will just come out and say, well, I'm for 20. And then it's like, well, you just made up the 15, Bernie, so I'm just making up a higher number. And someone will come along and say a higher number. And that's why the left always seems to go to its worst, most extreme place, because its, it's ethos is not built in, oh, we, we believe in individual rights or we believe in limited government. It's just, oh, we feel a certain way about something. I feel that it should be 20. You feel it should be 15. You must be a bad guy. And then they'll somehow trick you into thinking you're racist for that too. That's also why they purge people. So I think that basically is sort of it at the moment. But to really get to your question, I mean, it sucks to lose friends. We've, we've all been through it. Uh, and I think you should, you should go out of your way to extend the hand of friendship and not try to, you know, just, just run ransack through everybody and lose friends. But at some point, 
you know, you don't want to be a punching bag either. And I've had plenty of those experiences and it's not fun. And you hope that maybe years from now, someone will, someone will come around. Dave, I really liked the last chapter of your book where you talked about you've got to be able to take a break from the political and not view the whole world through political lenses the whole time. I think that's really important because we, you know, our side often tries to get or gets portrayed as being angry about everything when in fact it's the other side that's angry about everything. So what do you explain that bit and what you mean by that to our listeners? Yeah, well, I think you're right on this idea. And again, like the sides thing is always a weird way to frame things. But yes, broadly speaking, if we're talking about people that are for liberty and people that are for like state power, I think the problem with being for power generally, being an authoritarian, believing that government or politics is the answer, it can only lead you to misery because what you're always trying to do is create a perfect system. You're always trying to create, so, okay, we're not going to have poor people. We're not going to have rich people. Everyone's going to be the same all the time. Well, that's not how human nature works. It's not, it's not, it's actually antithetical to, I think, what the purpose of being a human is. And they believe that they can create the perfect system. Now, the problem, of course, in that is that humans are imperfect. So we cannot create a perfect system. This would be, by the way, uh, why Thanos in Avengers had to kill half of the universe, right? What did he do? He got the gauntlet and what did he do? He wiped away half of the universe because he, what he wanted to do is he said, well, we have finite resources in the universe and the only way to make sure we continue is to kill half the universe. No one will do it. I'll do it. I'm the good guy. Well, by the way, that's very much in line with what happens every time socialism starts to take root. Lots of people get killed. You start turning on your neighbor. You're always looking for somebody else uh, because it's not about what is fundamentally good for your life. It's about this, this never ending need to virtue signal. So I, I don't want to be part of a system that is looking to take a lot of people out. You can't build a perfect system. I think the closest you can build to a perfect system is pretty close to what we have in America. It's pretty close to what you guys have in Australia and what some of the other nations have, which is governments that should basically stay out of your life. Now, by the way, this is all a very tenable thread. And while we're all locked in our houses and can't congregate and meet people together and all of those things, whether you think that's good or bad or necessary or not, these are dangerous precedents being set right now. You know, we have the right to assembly in the United States and in effect, that's being suspended right now. Um, so these are things we have to think about. But I think the best way to govern is to just stay out of your life. And you know what? If you, my neighbor, I don't know what my neighbor's doing over there all day long, but as long as he doesn't encroach on my property, steal my stuff, attack me, anything else, he's entitled to his life. And that's that's the exchange you have to have in a free society. Yeah, with the virtue signaling, I see this as not something that one side of politics owns. I think virtue signaling is now just what everyone does. And I think uh, some a way we're seeing virtue signaling right now in a non-political sphere is look how seriously I'm taking coronavirus. And that's not to say the coronavirus <laughs> isn't serious. It is a problem. Yeah. But I mean, you've detailed on your Instagram feed, I think it was, or uh, in one of your social media channels, how in Los Angeles, the government's now paying people to snitch out neighbors for doing things. And those neighbors are just, uh, sorry, those people are just gladly going along, snitching out uh, their people in their lives, which is just I mean, a very weird way to live your life, in my view. Yes. The idea that you turn neighbor on neighbor to report them to the government for doing something like that. I, I'm not saying if my neighbor's breaking into somebody's house, yeah, you could call the cops. But the idea that, oh, you'd see two neighbors walking their dogs and go, whoa, whoa, you guys are in five feet of each other, not six feet of each other. We're going to snitch you out. Or that, or that somebody opens their restaurant and maybe doesn't do exactly what the authorities are saying you have to do regarding, you know, having people wait outside or just whatever, whatever it might be. I'm not even, that's not even a commentary on what we should or shouldn't be doing related to coronavirus, right? The point is that, that the government would start instigating an idea that you will make money if you're looking out for your bad guy neighbors, man, that's what they do in communist Russia, what they did in communist Russia. That's what they did in Nazi Germany. This idea that you're, you're basically acting as a government informant. And of course, what happens? Eventually that comes around on you too, because every, you think you're the one that's being good, but somebody's watching you too. So I just think we have to, we're, we're in a really, really weird place in the world right now, because we're deeply free in many regards, and yet in, the, in another regard, I basically, except to walk my dog, have not left my house in five weeks. 
that, that is a really, really weird thing, which by the way, of course, I wrote the book before coronavirus, but I think the principles that I'm laying out here that we're talking about right now are the principles that will ultimately help free us from this. Uh, but we have to be really worried about that sort of thing. Imagine, you know, you guys finding out that your, your mayor in your town or, or your local representative is going to pay you if, uh, you know, you find, oh my God, these two people got together for a drink. Sure, they've both been quarantined for a month. They both know they're healthy, but they decided to meet, you know, and have a beer. It's like, th this is crazy stuff. Dave, have you been surprised uh, and or disappointed by how quickly and how willing people have been willing to give up their freedoms in the face of this latest crisis? <sighs> you know, I wish I could say I was surprised, but I'm not really surprised. I mean... Look, I'm I'm doing what the government's asking. You know what I mean? Right now, I'm doing what the government's asking. I'm I'm not going out in groups. Uh, you know, I'm doing the social distancing. My, you guys know my. This is my home. We're in my studios in my garage. Normally, I have staff here. My my house is also an office. We haven't had anyone here in a month. My guys are all working remotely. We're doing all those things. Um, but I think Americans, as I said before, you guys have a little different version of it. But Americans have this unique thing of don't tread on me. Like that is a core American principle that has been whittled away over 200 years. I think the founders would actually be quite dismayed at the way we allow government in on so much and the, the way we've created a cult of personality around the president as if he's a king. You know, whether you like Trump or not, the guy is not a king. And we want to be very wary of a king, right? You want as much control in your state, hopefully, as possible. So I'm not surprised because, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges the West has right now is that it's so good in the West. We are so free. Poor people in the West would be considered rich people in the East. There, there's so many uh, examples of that, that we've kind of, we've kind of grown fat on our ideas. And what I'm worried about is, okay, yeah, we've done five weeks of lockdown. Um, and you know, the economy's hurting and you know, there's a, a tremendous amount of people on unemployment and the rest of it, but you know, we're not looting, we're not fighting yet. You know, it's, it's basically working, but what I'm worried about is, of course, I'm worried at some level that, you know, the economy could get worse and looting and the rest of it. But what I'm really worried about is, okay, well now here in Los Angeles, they said we're in lockdown until May 15th. Well, we know if they're saying May 15th right now, it doesn't mean they're going to unlock it on May 16th. We know that maybe they'll tear it out for different ages, different health, whatever it is. But what I'm more worried about is, oh, they'll have run a test. I don't mean this in a conspiracy they, but a test, a massive worldwide test is being run right now. And can governments get people to just stay in their houses? And the test has been successful. So I, I am worried. I don't mean that in like some massive globalist plan, you know, that kind of thing. I just mean it just the way humans behave. Like there was a test run, whether, whether it was a planned test or not, but we've all been in our houses and we haven't done anything and we're not killing each other yet. And what that bodes for the future, I don't know. All right, I got one more question and it's something that I think we talked about last time we were on the show, but there's just more and more evidence for it. So look, yourself and Joe Rogan, two of the biggest podcasts, two of the biggest chat shows in the game, you've built empires based off the idea of just letting guests talk just having two people, there's never a shouting match. It is just a genuine, honest discussion about people's ideas. And when I'm watching the CNN Democratic debates, the <laughs> CNN would go to like a, an eight-person panel and I and like David Axelrod and Andrew Yang were the only two people that I was really tuning into. And it was just like, I'm sitting there going like, how do you not realize you've got these two and if you could just let them talk for an hour, it would be a better show. Like, why is mainstream media not seeing what you're doing, not seeing what Joe Rogan's doing and going, why don't we do that? Well, I think there's a lot there. You know, interestingly, the two guys that you liked out of those giant panels when they do that, I mean, Axelrod was an Obama campaign manager, I think. And Yang was, had just dropped out as a candidate when next thing you know, he's there as a pundit. And even that is a bit of a problem, right? Like when you, when you watch CNN and they've got eight boxes and it's like, oh, Republican strategist and this guy worked for Clinton and this guy worked for Bush and this guy this. And it's like, why would I think that I could possibly ascertain anything remotely close to the truth from all of these people whose job it specifically was not to tell us truth while they were, had the other job, you know? So I think there's a weird game where for many, many years before the internet, it basically was the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. And we didn't know what was going on behind the curtain. And we thought it was just this incredible thing. And we all sort of listened to it. Well, then the internet came around. We peeled the curtain back. We see this old guy there 
who's not really great at what he does and maybe is a, a sham altogether. And I think that's why we're seeing these things crumble. So in the old days, when CNN maybe did a, a hit piece or a dishonest smear or the New York Times, which I think has unfortunately become the worst of all of these, um, when they would do uh, uh, some sort of dishonest piece of journalism in the old days, there was no way for people to fight back. You know, you'd read an article and you either accepted it as true or maybe you'd go to your friend, you know, you'd be sitting at a, at a coffee shop and you'd go, you know, I just read this article and something doesn't seem right here. And he'd go, ah, you're nuts. Or he'd go, oh, maybe you're right. But now because of Twitter, because of video, because of YouTube, it's like every time I see CNN clip something of Trump to try to get Trump, I'm like, you know what? I guarantee when I see the longer clip of this thing, that is going to be completely out of context or it's going to be a joke or something else. And, and every single time it is. And they keep, they keep thinking they can lie. I'll, I'll give you a great example of this. I was uh, in December. I spoke at the Turning Point Student Action Summit. I spoke that morning, a couple thousand kids there. And then uh, Trump spoke shortly after me. It was, I didn't even realize it when I got there that I was speaking before the president, but it was pretty, pretty cool. I had never heard Trump speak live before, so I've only seen it on TV like you guys have. I'm sitting in the first row. Trump goes up there. He speaks for about an hour and a half, and it's, and it's Trump. So he's a little bit on prompter doing the prepared stuff. And then, you know, he just ad-libs, and he's basically like working like a comic. He's working the room. He's kind of doing crowd work, you know, the whole thing. At one point, he does this, this thing about wind power, and, he's and he goes, you know, I know more about wind power than anybody. I've been studying wind power my whole life, blah, blah, blah. And I turn to the guy next to me and I'm like, I know that that's the clip CNN's gonna play. That's the headline that, that BuzzFeed's gonna run with. Donald Trump says he knows more about wind power than anyone. Now, the next three minutes of the speech, he was actually making quite salient points about wind power, right? And talking about where turbines are and how that affects communities and birds. I mean, it was actually quite thoughtful. But the headline is Donald Trump claims he knows more about wind power than anybody. He's been studying it his whole life. And it's like, either he meant it as a joke or he's just punking you guys. But the fact that you fall for it every time shows there is something wrong with you. And, and unfortunately, one of the things that we've seen, and I know you guys get this, is what they do is, it, all I want, I don't take any great pleasure, you could probably hear it, I don't take great pleasure in the fact that mainstream journalism is so bad. I don't even consider myself a journalist. I'm an interviewer, a half-retired comedian, a chat guy, you know, whatever it is. But I try to tell people the truth the best way I can. And I think, unfortunately, these guys just always double down. And it's like, guys, you don't have to be great and we'd all accept it, but, but just don't be blatantly horrible. And they seem unable to, to get that message. All right, brilliant. Uh, Dave Rubin, author of Don't Burn This Book. Once again, that is out today. There is a link in the show notes. You can go buy it. Uh, it's an awesome book, awesome read. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. You guys are all stars. We need some freedom fighters across the world. So I, I look forward to escaping this uh, self-lockdown self one day and getting back across the pond and over to Australia and you know having awesome. some beers with you guys. Yeah, right. good to see you. Okay, thank you to Dave Rubin. That was an awesome interview. Uh, we learned a lot. We grew as people. And yeah, I think we're now officially friends with Dave Rubin. I think so. And I like that you pointed out that we grew as people because that's what that was. It was growing as people. No, that was really good. As I said at the start, I liked that he remembered us. But also the aspect of it for me that I liked is that it was a guide. It was a how-to thing. It's not a thing about you know new ideas or anything like that. So give it to your friend who is like, this is the book I'm talking about. Give it to your friend who's like on the cusp and you can tell that they're on the cusp politically. Give them the book because it has it. I liked the bit especially about the immense personal benefits from being true to yourself. So yeah. Yes, yeah, so that is Don't Burn This Book that Peter wants you to send over to your mates and you can get that at Booktopia. If you're listening in Australia, Booktopia have it. They're the, uh, the best Australian distributors of the book, so Booktopia is where you want to go. Uh, and the URL is in the show notes. And once again, if a great way for you to be able to send that book to your friends is to enter the competition I mentioned at the start of the interview. If you're not a member of the IPA, you're listening to this, head on over to ipa.org.au slash join. If you're one of the first 20 people to sign up with a promo code Ruben, Ruben, uh, you win a signed copy of Don't Burn This Book. It's only available for Australians. Get on it and then give. The, uh, then you read the book and then you give it to a friend who should also read the book. No, they Sense. then they have to buy the book as well because we want as many people buying this book as possible. That's exactly right. That's Everyone exactly buy right. the what, book. What do you think of the interview, James? Uh, so my takeaway, like... 
the best thing about Dave's book for me was, yeah, you just feel better about yourself once you uh, start saying what's on your mind, especially in university uh, classes. I mean, I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but definitely my first few years of university, I was definitely the kind of guy that says, you know what, keep your head down, say what the tutor wants you to say, get the grade and get the hell out of there. And then in the third year, I'm like, I hate this. It's boring. I'm sick of letting people get away with saying stupid things. It decided to start taking people on and mm. uni actually became tolerable after that when I was like the bad cop in a few of my shoots, uh, letting people know that no, the French Revolution terror did not, uh, did actually go too far. And people were saying that it didn't. Uh, someone saying that, you know, deregulation was the cause of the global financial crisis. When I said uh, that it was actually the government, I exploded a tutor's brain, which was always fun to do. So yeah, just definitely the talking for yourself angle is what I took away from it. It's just like, yes, it's, that's exactly right. A monster was unleashed and we've not been able to put the Pandora's... What is it? No, the genie back into the bottle. No, yes, that's great the stuff. genie back into Pandora's box. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly what right. All best, right. What, what was your takeaway, Peter? I did my takeaway. Oh, you did your takeaway. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> so now that we have Dave Rubin as... I didn't know that counted as your takeaway. I've done now two takeaways. Dave, now that we have Dave Rubin as official recurring guest of the show, uh, I think we've officially made it. And yeah. I was wondering what you were going to, you know, we've got this newfound fame. How are you going to let it change you? Just become sloppy and complacent, I reckon. Oh, That's yeah? always been my thing. As the show has got bigger and bigger, I've always said now is the time to get sloppy and complacent. You've always said no. Yeah, I thought you did that harder. about 100 episodes ago. Well, I think we should do it more. Okay, fair enough. I was going to use argument. this fame to become uh, more difficult to work with. I'm going <laughs> to find ways to be more annoying to, as a uh, colleague and then implement this. I want to become a diva. I, that would be amazing if you could achieve that. Um, all right, so let's get into the stories of the week, shall we, James? How do you feel about that? I feel pretty good. Sorry, that's good with, uh, you were... the tracing app. Yeah, tracing app. All right, so we've been talking about the app for you know on Friday and and the last week we had an excellent interview with Dr. Chris Berg who covered all the issues. So if you want to know more, check that out. Now it was released on Sunday afternoon. The tracing app. Almost two million people have downloaded it since it became available. Really interesting, a news poll published in The Australian on Monday found 54% of Australians said they'd download it. So James, I think if 54% of people say they're going to download it, that means that of that 54%, a few of them won't get around to it because, you know, people's lives are busy. So I don't know what that means for how many people will end up downloading it. There's been a few stories about some tech people saying the privacy regulations are good. I did see that. And some tech people saying there's still questions about how the key to decrypt these ideas and what circumstances under which they might accidentally or deliberately be shared has been raised. James, what do you think? Uh, yeah, so the like even if not all those 54% of people get around to doing it, I think 2 million people downloading the app in 48 hours is a bit of a uh, sign that I was wrong last week's show when I said that I don't think this app's going to take off. It is definitely taken off. And I think it's... Like, I interpret it as, I mean, you can take away maybe Australians don't care as much about privacy or civil liberties like that as we thought. I think it's just more Australians are so sick of coronavirus, they want to get back to work. And it's like, all right, if this is the app that helps us get there, then all right, as long as it does go away once the second, the second coronavirus is over, then I'll do it. I mean, I'm still, look, I'm not going to download the app. Stephen Conroy said he's not downloading the app. Former communications minister, that should tell you something. Pub, uh, some public servant who used to, uh, I don't know. Like, I'm seeing a lot of people saying they're not downloading the app. I'm seeing a lot of people saying they are. Uh, but yeah, like, I guess, you know, the, it's over to the government now. They've said this is incredibly safe. It's not going to get hacked. It's going to, the information's going to be deleted. The second coronavirus is over. I mean, pr the proof is going to be in the pudding. We've already seen this morning how... There was this text chain that went out to... I, I, like, it wasn't clear whether it was just random people or only people that had downloaded the app, but there was a text chain saying, you've been located, it's 20 kilometers away from your house, please call this number, and then, you know, mm -hmm. that's a scam. So, pretty concerning that within 24 hours, we've already got a fair few hackers out there trying to get people's information or using the app potentially, so... We talked with Chris Berg last week about how this is a giant honeypot for not only foreign governments, but also just bad actors in general of all these Australians' private data. I'm a bit concerned. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. You made about 14 points in a row, but I think that... It was um... pretty good. It was a, it, you asked me for my points and uh, you got them. I'm surprising Stephen Conroy's not downloading it. The guy that wanted to control the media is suddenly all of a sudden like, wow, well, this is government overreach. I'm not going to yeah. give you my data. So that's interesting from him. But I think that, um, yeah, I think you're right. People, I don't think people care about um, 
their privacy. Like we were discussing with my mates, heaps of them were like, I don't care. The government's not going to, doesn't care what I'm doing. I'm not worried about it. So I think you're right there. Uh, and also, yeah, you're right. The people are sick of coronavirus. And by saying, if you all download this app, coronavirus is officially over. That sort of persuades a lot of people to get involved. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so that's the, that's my 14 takes in 45 seconds on the app. So, uh, you know, that's why that's why I'm well suited for Twitter. I can get all my points out in 240 characters or less and then I just move on. That, well, that's good stuff, mate. I, I think I'll download it because I don't think I'll get to meet my nephew unless I do. I think that's going to be the rule from his parents. A few weeks ago, I mentioned I just had a nephew born, so I think I might end up doing it. But That's yeah. how they get to you, Pete. That's how they that's get, how they get to you. you they, they're emotional terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> my sister-in-law's parents listen to this show, so I'll, uh, they'll hear that and they'll report I'm just talking about it. the people in general. Like, You need to be a holdout, Pete. We can't have a show talking about the privacy concerns and then one week later, Peter Gregory, the voice of the people, crumbles like that. <laughs> if the nephew wants to meet me, you can meet me when he turns 18. No, <laughs> yeah. all right. So, yeah, James, tell us... Yeah. Some... All right, I was going to keep going with that. But I think that's a move on. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go to lockdown restrictions. All right, so uh, in conjunction with the app coming out, a few states around Australia are starting to ease restrictions. So we've got Western Australia is lifting its uh, ban- uh, maximum amount of people from a gathering from two people to 10 people. That's both indoor and outdoor. Queensland's lifting restrictions uh, starting this weekend on driving, shopping for non-essential items, national parks, picnics, jet skis, and boats. By the way... How is jet skis breaking social distancing? Like, how big do does the Queensland government think jet skis are? Uh, mm. But that's not the point. Uh, New South Wales says you can have two adult visitors to your house starting from Friday. Unfortunately, Peter and I in Victoria, there are absolutely uh, no developments in easing social restrictions and news that surprises absolutely no one. So, it is good to see that there are states around Australia that are going like, okay, I... Uh, these restrictions might be going a bit too far for where coronavirus is right now. We're going to start easing off. Yeah, it's great to see. It's what we've been talking about for the last few weeks. I think you're right. Victoria is definitely the worst because we're, you know, it's the most socialist government in Australia. I think that also in WA, you know, it's good to see the number of people. Oh, I just spat on my microphone. Sorry about that, Saul. People didn't need people, to know that. <laughs> I was just in case they saw it on the screen. Anyway, uh, the number of people at a party going from two. Groups of two to groups of 10, which, you know, I've seen Ben Cousins' documentary. You can have a party with less than 10 people in WA. And the, although while I'm on WA, one problem I do have is Premier Mark McGowan said yesterday, I think, uh, regarding these restrictions that they were changing, we've, lift, we've lifted this restriction. We've given people a reward, but with reward comes responsibility. Uh, Premier Mark McGowan, you haven't given people a reward you've restored the ancient liberties they have as australians you're not a parent and we're not children drop the tone buddy but he did uh stand up for people having suvlaki's mid run so i'm still pro mcgowan but that one that quote does hurt (laughs) what was the suvlaki thing you're allowed to oh mid run you can get a suva yeah yeah and then he started crying and laughing oh people are complicated aren't they (laughs) yeah (laughs) people are all different shades uh I want to know, does the IPA get credit for being the first to say this loudly that uh, some of these restrictions have gone too far? Because four weeks ago, if you said anything like, uh, if you said, okay, some of these restrictions have gone too far, they could be curtailed and people can uh, have gatherings of up to 10, you were basically a cold-hearted capitalist that thought the factory should be powered by throwing grandmothers into furnaces. And now, four weeks later, you're just a normal person. So when does the IPA get credit for being the, one of the leaders in that field? That's exactly right. It's not even that. It's like the IPA still gets accused of, you know, not caring about old people dying whilst those same people in those same publications are making the case that we should be easing the lockdown. So it's not even like that they're not going to give us credit. They're going to they're not going to stop bagging us. So uh, that's what I've noticed as we that was my number one take and I forgot to say it is that, you know, Gideon Rosner made this video and everyone went nuts. That was like 5 minutes ago. And now yeah. all these publications are saying we should do the same thing. So I think like everything the IPA does will get heaps of credit in just a minute. Yeah, exactly. So if you did get attacked because you thought six month lockdowns were a bit bad four weeks ago, be vindicated. Be vindicated by history. We will smile upon you. Be a bit smug, I reckon. Uh, all right. So last ca- uh, thing we want to talk about, this has sort of been bubbling away in the background. We haven't talked about it yet, but about time we did. So Peter Gregory, why aren't kids in school? This is something That's really- Dr. Bella de Berra has been pushing... Uh, it, wait, is this your one or my one? I forget. This is my one, but whatever. Okay, Pete, 
why aren't kids at school? Tell us okay. why. <laughs> that's why I started answering because you were like, yeah. anyway. Uh, well, I mean, that's what this is, you know, we've got to listen to the experts, James. We, we must listen to the experts in everything we do with regard to fo- fighting coronavirus. The message from teachers from the federal government, from the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee is that it's safe to go back to school it's safe for teachers to teach in school with a, with appropriate measures in place. You're right. This is something that's been bubbling away that we haven't been talking about. And, and finally, now we're having the opportunity to talk about it is that students should absolutely be in school. There's a number of, uh, there's a number of factors at play. Oh, a number of states have different approaches to this. You'll be not surprised, James, that Northern Territory has the best approach. Uh, my mate, uh, what's his name? Chief Minister Gunner, my mate Chief Minister Gunner says, teachers are not babysitters, they're educators. Our schools will be open because they are safe because education is essential. So good on you, Gunner. Uh, Victoria, no surprise there, is the worst. The whole of Term 2 will be delivered remotely in Victoria. Uh, and on all the states have different times where they're going to introduce the students back at different timelines. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There is no reason why we can't start letting back kids back into school. They don't all have to go to school at the same time. We could do you know, roster on, roster off, things like that. Yeah, that's uh, what New South Wales are doing. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that sounds like the right thing to do. But, you know, people will remember this, that the unions are holding the education system to ransom and holding parents to ransom. Uh, no, I'm with Northern Territory and South Australia. The federal health advice is that uh, children pose an extremely low risk. And I think I saw in Kenny last night that only one case in Australia has been transmuted, transmitted from student to teacher or teacher to student. Uh, then why aren't schools back right now? I don't think you do need a rusted on thing. I think it's just let's get things back there. Yeah, well, no, exactly right. But um, it's it's the unions. The unions are saying the teachers aren't safe. And I think that when history, you know, looks back, we've seen a lot of history about how the unions behaved during World War Two, yeah. which was mentioned in Bella's piece. I actually thought of that before I read it in Bella's piece. I'd like everyone to know that there's all these stories about you know the unions keeping ships waiting during World War Two, and people might remember remember that. People might remember the way the unions have behaved with regards to education. This time around, why are you laughing? Oh, because uh, you went from, uh, what was it? <laughs> you sidestepped the fact that you'd went soft by saying we need a New South Wales-style rollout of t- students to go like, okay, I'm going to go very hard on the unions all of a sudden. I went soft? Hang on, I, didn't, I did not even realise that I had gone soft. Because uh, you said we could have a roster-on, roster-off situation. Yeah, we yeah. can. Yeah. But the, What's wrong with like, that? I'm, it, it's soft. <laughs> Why? Do so with the New South Wales, New the Northern Territory and South Australia and just have schools go on as normal. There's no, there's nothing wrong with seeing it for doing that for a few weeks and see if infection rates change. I think it's better than it's better than having the whole term done remotely. Yeah, but the other ones are having the whole term done at school and encourage kids to come to school. I just think there's no harm in in seeing what the infection rates are like. So, uh, so yeah, so, Chief Medical Officer Brendan Murphy so said, I did not uh, sidestep anything, mate. If you were here, I'd punch on. That's why, you know, this is what remotely does. You know, we can't get physical when we have arguments. It'd be good for the show. Uh, so, yeah, um, well, that's Bella's point is correct that these are the states with the most militant teacher unions, are the ones with the uh, lowest amount of things. Uh, sorry, lowest amount of uh, return back to normal. So, shall we move on to Heroes and Villains, Peter? Let's do it, mate. All right, so this is the Grant the Pig Freedom Snort. This is the snort that we give to people who have stood up for freedom around the world this week. So, Pete, who is your hero of the week? Did you know what, James? I can't find... Oh, I found it. Oh, my God. I thought I didn't write it down. No, I've got my hero for this week. My hero, which James said was a bit snoozy, actually, so we can decide at the end of this uh, segment whether or not it's a bit snoozy. Peek behind the curtain for the people. Is silent deregulation. Silent deregulation. Now, Chris Berger wrote a great piece in the Australian Financial Review yesterday where he talked about, might have been the day before, in the last couple of days, he talked about there's been a wave of deregulation across the economy as a result of, of COVID. All these, all these regulations which couldn't ever be changed for years and years in the wake of COVID got changed, which if you recall, James, is something that we were calling for because we were talking about, you know, there's all this stimulus to revive the economy. Why don't we reduce some regulation? Well, that has happened. As Chris writes... Uh, there's but almost no historical parallel for this. Uh, we've seen, you know, in medicine, medical face masks, ventilators, production of that regulation has been relaxed. Nursing supervision requirements for nursing has been relaxed. Curfews on delivery trucks, liquor licensing rules with delivering alcohol. Construction can now be done on weekends and public holidays. There's there's, there's more. APRA has eased capital requirements on banks, whatever that is. Um, ASIC uh, ASIC shrink in the boardrooms thing where they were putting bureaucrats in people's boardrooms to see if they were behaving well has been, uh, what's it called? It's been stopped. 
<laughs> uh, and and even Australian content requirements in Australian TV has been eradicated for the time being. So the so this is without parallel. We haven't talked about it. No one really knows about it. It's a great story. Chris Berg potentially shouldn't have blew the whistle on it because now everyone will find out about it and start questioning it. But it's a great stuff. It's it's great stuff. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. I won't say it was a bit snoozy, but uh, yeah, no, that's good stuff. And uh, yeah. There's a few things coming out of coronavirus which are like, why isn't this thing? Why isn't it like this all the time? So hopefully, yeah, those deregulation efforts uh, keep going. My hero this week is <laughs> ESPN and the NFL. For I watched the NFL draft on the weekend. I normally wouldn't do it. I'm with the comedian Bill Burr. It's usually like watching the high school ceremony, uh, graduation ceremony of a school you didn't go to. But for five glorious hours on the weekend, sports was back. And yeah. I just really want to shout out ESPN and NFL. You had all the different commentators and different teams in their homes connecting in. I have no idea how they pulled off such an effort, but for five glorious hours, sports was back, and that made me happy. Well, that's great, James. Did, you, did your team pick up any Jerry Judy, the wide receiver out of Alabama. How good is that name? Jerry Judy. <laughs> That it is a good name. Is he the next Dustin Martin or is he the next Jack Trengove? Only time uh, will tell. Only time will tell. All right. Uh, so my, uh, let's head over to Villains, Pete. Yeah, Villains. All right. So Villains is, uh, as we know, the uh, Extinction Rebellion fake nudie run villainy award. Roll the tape, Saul. As Extinction Rebellion protests enter their sixth day. All right, James, who's your villain? Okay, Pete, this is a choose your own adventure. You can either choose people simping for Kim Jong-un's sister or Chris <laughs> Kenny. I want to know what simping means. Uh, so simping... So I want to go, how do I put this in a family-friendly way? It so sounds like something is, you want. Uh, say, all right, so say, Peter, that you there was a female on the internet that you wanted to uh, express your fandom for in, a, <laughs> in words, yeah. and there was no chance of you know reciprocation of your feelings from her, but it did not stop you for a period of months. That would be simping. So is it means praising someone on social media who's yeah. famous? Yeah, and of and a female, and it just makes everyone a bit uncomfortable. Okay, and it's someone who's try who's after that woman, like who wants to have a relationship yeah. with that woman. I'd say so. Yes. <laughs> okay, carry on. Sorry, want, tell me more. You want the simping, or do you want Chris Kenny? I want simping. <laughs> Leave Chris Kenny out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some more no simping. simping from Chris Kenny. I'll put that on the record. But he could have been a villain. Uh, so, yeah. So, Kim Jong-un might be dead. No one knows. Uh, like, the rumor is he's unresponsive. So, anyway, Kim jo Young, his sister, looks like she's going to be taking over. People might remember she came on people's radars at the Winter Olympics last year when the New York Times were like... Well, oh, I had the, the, had the immortal headline, Kim Jong-un's sister turns on the charm taking Mike Pence's spotlight. <laughs> oh, that's sorry. Right. Remember that? That was this yeah. first case of people going like, wait, whose side are we all on here? Because that's still a North <laughs> Korean dictator. I think people's standards for North Korean leaders are so low that if they're not currently in the act of murdering someone for their political beliefs, people are like, hey, look at this person. This is I don't change. think that was it. I think it's because they hate Pence. Well, true. So anyway, uh, there's now, now that she's taken over, people are like, oh, look at this. And... There's a bit of simping. I want to take Art Tavana, who is a columnist over in America. He's written for Playboy, LA Weekly, stuff like that. Uh, he tweeted out, Kim Jo Young, uh, Kim Yo Jong is about to become one of the world's most Googled people on the planet. She also looks like she's going to completely own Trump in every possible negotiation scenario. <laughs> Dude, keep it down. <laughs> who side sorry, are you so, on? Who is that, sorry? Art Tavana. That, what, what is their, what are they, what's their job? Oh, so that's just a random. No, it's a journalist. He's written for Playboy. He's written for LA Weekly. He's got like 10,000 Twitter followers. It was just like the most egregious example I saw. That is absolute simping. Yeah. Every day of the way. How on earth would you know if she's a good negotiator? Like, <laughs> how would you know that? Yeah. Stop simping, mate. It's just, and this, this like 80 year old billionaire, how old's Trump? I don't know. He's like 70 or 80 years old and he's a billionaire, but he definitely doesn't know much of, as much about negotiating as like this 30 year old. The photo woman. of a person I saw once. Who, who every single person she's ever spoken to is scared they're going to die because they're speaking to her. She would be really good at negotiating. I'm sure she's yep. better than a New York real estate agent. <laughs> anyway. All right. Uh, so who is your villain, Peter? Tr typical simping. Uh, my villain is the... Um, is that going to be your word for the week? Are you going to use that like a million times? <laughs> I really like it. When you put it on the sheet, I was like, oh, what's simping? I hope that's not something that's inappropriate. Anyway, 
Um, oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna use it heaps. I'm gonna use it heaps. Speaking of simping, not really um, <laughs> at all. <It> begins. <laughs> my my villain is JobKeeper because it's creating a few problems. Now we know JobKeeper is a fifteen hundred dollar a week fortnight for people who've lost their job for businesses who have to close down because of COVID. But it's emerged that some workers are claiming it because they can. it's more than what they normally get paid. So rather than work, they're trying to get their business to pay them the $1,500 payment. I can't believe you know an 18-year-old would rather get paid like three times as much for doing no work instead of doing a 10-hour shift at Macca's. I can't believe that. Anyway, a business owner who remained, wished to remain anonymous because she feared retribution in New South Wales said she employed 50 staff and she'd struggled to pay them uh, casual workers who used to earn 400 bucks a fortnight, the JobKeeper amount of $1,500 a fortnight while she waited for reimbursement from the government. So the business has to pay it first. Uh, she said, one of our young casuals who does 10 hours a week said, I'm entitled to it. Go to the bank and get my money. I said, it's not money for jam, which is a great saying. Uh, what are we breeding in young ones? Anyway, there was, a few more, there was a few more examples, which I won't go through now, but 6 million people are expected to get it. Uh, businesses apply, as I said, for job keep it because they can't afford to keep their staff on 1500 bucks no matter what uh it's just a bit of a problem emerging workers who you know why would you want to work i was going to sort of make it that the casual workers knocking back shifts line as my villain but then i thought well why would you <laughs> if you're going to get more money from job keeper and why would you work so i guess it's the, the perverse incentives of job keeper would yeah be i villain. mean this is the kind of thing like i still like job keeper more than the new start solution to it but uh yeah the fifth like when it was 1500 blanket for everyone i'd say this is a biggest loss for people that are fans of the ubi like this kind of story people going oh mm. the ubi wouldn't suck productivity or wouldn't suck ingenuity out of the society like ugh, bad story for you to read that is a good point i didn't think of that well done james no uh, that's true and uh, and it's also like I get that they wanted to get it out quickly, and there were six million people affected and all that. But like, why does it have to be? Can, can't there be two amounts? Can't there be like fifteen hundred for full time workers and seven fifty for casual workers? Like, does that add that much administration? I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah, well, I, I think you just got to get a policy out before you know your rents due and bills start paying up because then you're going to get some very very oh. uh, angry people simping for scomo, are you, mate? <laughs> It's Assuming for uh, the Australian working class is what I'm doing, Pete. Standing up for their right to, you know, uh, not get their livelihoods destroyed on a government shutdown. I think that is, you have absolutely verbaled me there. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. And you know, and the thing is, you know it. What I'm saying is, you could have, this bill could have been crafted a little bit better to slightly yes, reduce. The, I, I'm the with you there. I'm with you there. But I still like JobKeeper in the macro form, I guess. So, uh, good villain. Anyway. Pete's not fine. Australia's favourite new podcast segment. Yeah, so we're going straight into the old stuff. Uh, not the old stuff, the, the funny stuff the because stuff. we did the interview, at the interview at the start. I've lost it. Doing this much in a row is actually really hard for my brain. I usually like a little break around now. Anyway, whatever. The things I do for you well, guys. I've picked, up a, I've picked up a Tim Tam and I don't have a chance to eat it for another 10 minutes. Unless this segment <laughs> goes long, I'm going to see if I can eat a Tim Tam while you do this. I've got three examples. You could eat a Tim Tam during this. So as we said, Pete's not fine. All the examples of the crazy fines that are going around Australia. I've got three examples this week for you, James. Now, there was a fella in Austral, which I believe is in Queensland, Carriage Street in Austral. Uh, officers spotted two men fleeing the scene from a party. There's a big party happening. Two men fleeing the scene. One of the men was caught at a nearby property a short time later. Upon his arrest, he told police he was simply going for a run while he attempted to evade them. I reckon that excuse has been made a fair bit over the last few weeks by recalcitrant Australians saying they were exercising one more. Oh, number two, uh, $1,300 fine was hard handed to enthusiast and founder of car advice, Al Balls Falar, who's Aston Martin. He says he's fuel for the soul. He says a lot of people... They go running, they go cycling, I go driving. Now, he explained to the officers, mate, the only... So he got in his car, went for a drive just to relax. The only person he spoke to was the officer finding him, and he explained that to the officer and saying, look, mate, I'm in my car, I'm not speaking to anyone, I'm not spreading the virus. Ended up getting his fine revoked, so good on your elbows for that. Just like the learner in Victoria who got their fine revoked. So that's a victory for the little people. And the last one, New South Wales Police confirmed South Sydney Rabbitohs fullback Latrell Mitchell, Melbourne Storming at Josh Addo Carr and Newcastle Knights squad member. That's a bit rough. They've said the positions of the other blokes, and for him, they've just called him a squad member. Uh, Tyron Roberts Davis 
That's a bit of a blow. Um, they got fined a thousand bucks for going camping, and there was photos of them camping and shooting and 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 biking and stuff like that. So yet another NRL story for our NS, uh, New South Wales listeners. Uh, we got a bit of fan mail during the week. Someone said, "What was it? We were saying rugby." No one in New South Wales says rugby, so hope we got it right this week. And which one was your favourite out of those three, James? That first guy, the two people running away, and then they were caught by the police and they were exercising. At what point are they wrong? Because they <laughs> yeah, are yeah, they're really running. <laughs> Yeah, they're running. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm, I'm struggling to see where they were wrong. And their fitness would have improved as a result of their running. I think their only problem was that they did it in a pair. They had to split up. Yeah. Because then, bra- then you're breaking social distancing when you do it in a pair. One go yeah. left, one go right. Do you know what? I read something once. And you keep running. The- you keep running until this weekend where you're allowed to gather in groups of 10. If you and keep going, okay. they, they can't claim that you're not. It's only five days you have to avoid the police for in a run. Anyway, we won't have to park this segment eventually because as they relax restrictions, you know. Although that very, might create a bit of confusion. Yeah, it's a very Icarus segment. <laughs> it's, it's flown very close to the sun. The yeah. candle that bri- burns twice as bright burns half as long. And I think that's, that's right. where Pete's not fine. It's going to fall. All right, last yeah. thing we need to go through is... Um, look, Pete, if you're having a press conference and you're trying to alert the American people as to whether or not uh, we're any closer to just uh, beating coronavirus, I don't think one of the takeouts you want is people asking themselves whether or not it's okay to drink bleach. Now, when I saw did Trump, uh, when I saw the tweet, did Trump just tell people to drink bleach? I, I assume like many people were thinking the truth is somewhere probably in the middle between the he didn't or he did because no one can believe anything. So here's the actual quote, and you let let. You interpret it as you will. Here's exactly what Trump said. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, it being coronavirus. One minute. And is there a way we can do something like that by injection inside or almost a cleaning? Because you see, it gets in the lungs and it does a tremendous number on the lungs. So it would be interesting to check that. So that you're going to have to use medical doctors with, but it sounds sounds interesting to me. Is that recommending people drink bleach? He's not recommending people drink bleach, but he was serious. Yes. And I think reason- it's one of those ones where it's important to let people know that people are thinking about outside-the-box solutions to coronavirus, like people are taking it seriously and we're doing some positive steps. But when you're out loud going like, disinfectant on the lungs is good, I think you just need to go like, oh, okay, let's bring that back in. Let's bring that back in. It's that's very... An inter- it's- that's an internal discussion. It's not an external one. Yeah, yeah. It's very Trump. Like, it's very like, I'm just going to throw this out there and see what happens. But... Uh, <laughs> yeah. and- the thing that made me think that he was serious is like the next day he was saying, he was asked about it and he was really narky in saying, I was being sarcastic. Like yeah. it was, you told me the other week what this saying was, but like thou doth protest too much, whatever it is. Yes. He's like, yeah, he, he was like. The Streisand effect. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, that's right. probably he, not it, yeah. He should have gone, well, look, I don't care what you guys think, I was joking. But he was like, no, 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 I was joking. And it's like classic wasn't joking by that behavior. Yeah. Well, he tried the same thing. So he tweeted over the weekend. Uh, he had a multiple tweets where he railed against the Nobel Prize. He kept calling it the Nobel Prize. Sorry, <laughs> not N-O-B-E-L, but N-O-B-L-E. Yeah. And using it to just like disparage journalists. And then he deletes those tweets and then says, uh, actually, I was talking about a different prize called the Nobel Prize, especially as it pertains to reporters and journalists. Nobel is defined as having or showing fine personal qualities or high moral principles <laughs> and ideals. Does sarcasm ever work? So, like, is that I was true? Being sarc- yeah, it was being sarcastic. It's just not a defense. So, hang on. Is there an actual w- award called the Nobel Prize? No. Like, well, who knows what was really going on? Like, anyone that can fully interpret this correctly. Who, uh, but Occam's Razor would tell you he misspelled or just got it the wrong way around on what the original Nobel Prize was. And now he's claiming sarcasm when it was like, I think he just goofed. That's another one where he should just tell the truth because I think he did misspell it, but also misspelling stuff doesn't matter. Like really smart people misspell spell easy words all the time, and he should I just mispronounce go, yeah, so- at least three words a show. I reckon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, but um, he could just go look. Yeah, I misspelled noble wrong, but I'm right. Here's my point. So yeah. you know, Trump needs if Trump needs some public relations, you, you know, advice from me, I can give it to him. But I would just admit it. Yes. All right. That is it for the show this week. Thank you to Dave Rubin. I'm just going to run through the details of our giveaway one more time. So don't burn this book, Thinking for Yourself in an Age of Unreason, available now on Booktop- in Booktopia. For Australian listeners, go to Booktopia. 
don't burn this book thinking for yourself in an age of unreason for our giveaway if uh, go to if you're not a member of the IPA if you're living in Australia it's only for people in Australia so if you're not a member of the IPA head on over to ipa.org.au slash join and if you're one of the first 20 people to sign up with a promo code Ruben you win a signed copy of don't burn this mm. book go out and read it and uh, it's an awesome awesome book and thank you to Dave for his time and we'll see you guys next week Stay up. Oh, no, on Friday. On Friday. My bad. Oh, yeah. Two shows now. So if you haven't checked out the Friday show, check it out. Yep. See you guys next week. (laughs) Goodbye.